Uh, it's very interesting. So yeah, I grew up in Okmulgee, Oklahoma, which is a town of about 13,000 in Oklahoma, just south of Tulsa. So, and it's a really diverse little town. It's about 40% white, 40% black, 20% native. So it was like a really cool little place to grow up in Oklahoma. Um, phenomenal. I love it. But Growing up in a small town, you know, there weren't very many spiritual people around me. There were a couple of hippies. And so I used to always tell my dad growing up, I'd be like, Dad, I know I was born in the wrong era. I was supposed to be a hippie because I would just felt like they knew something that the other religious people in Oklahoma didn't know. <laughs> and so um, I... Uh, Grew up in Oak Mulgee. Yeah, I went to high school. I was very, very involved in high school and in all the things, all the sports and, and academics. I was a valedictorian and played golf and um, cheerleading and did every single club and everything. I mean, I was just like, you know, the miss all of it. Kind of was the same way through college. I was a Kappa Kappa Gamma at the University of Oklahoma, sorority girl, <laughs> very involved in all of it. Massive, massive football fan, big partier, um, all the good stuff. But I was planning on going to med school when I was in college. But um, I was in lab one day and they were we were doing a an experiment on DNA and learning about DNA. And um, I Remember, they told us to break open the nucleus of the cell. So we broke open the nucleus of the cell. And then the protein, which is all of the um, plasma around the, the DNA that protects it inside the cell, they told us to wash it off and throw it in the trash. And I was like, this seems like a very important component if it's literally what's holding the DNA inside the nucleus of the cell. Like, well, it seems very important. So I was really frustrated that they told us that just – trash the protein around it. And then, so we started sequencing DNA. And I remember they told us we could only read three to 5% of the DNA strand and that other 95% they called junk DNA. And I was just like, these people don't know shit. <laughs> I am not going to med school. <laughs> and so that wasn't just that, that kept me from going to med school, but that definitely was the piece that got me to that to start thinking like, I don't think this is the right path for me. So yeah, we had a spectrometer. Yeah. I mean, that's how it would take a couple days back then to get to sequence DNA, but I mean, you would put the nuclear, the cell into a centrifuge and spin it and break it open and separate the pieces. And then when you separate everything, you'd get the, um, cause everything separates at different speeds. So you can speed up to one speed and separate certain parts out a second speed and get other parts out and whatnot. And then when you've got just the DNA left, you take the DNA and you sequence it through a spec. I can't remember the name of the machine right now. I think it's a spectrometer, but I, I'm saying that wrong, but I can't remember the name of the machine for sure. Cause it's been a while, but yeah, then you can sequence the DNA and that's where you get all the ATCGs and you can read the sequence of the DNA. And that's when they told us that you could only read three to 5% and the rest of it is called junk. And I was like, that's, DNA can't be junk. That, that can't be. <laughs> and so that was in college. And so I decided to not go to med school after college. I ended up moving to Charleston, South Carolina for a few years and then moved back to Tulsa. But I mean, I didn't grow up very religious. My parents, my grandparents were religious, but luckily I grew up Methodist, which is kind of religious light. That's what I call it. <laughs> it's like a lighter religion. <laughs> Did you really? Very cool. I lived on James Island. Oh, I moved there in 2004. So I lived there for a couple of years. No, I was a I was a party girl. I was a drinker and a and a studier. I was a I was a nerd and a partier. That's all I did was drink and study <laughs> for years. <laughs> so I was, uh, went to school and had this degree and didn't know what I was going to do with it. And so then when I moved out to Charleston, South Carolina, I ended up working at a bank out there for a few years at um. Oh, no, I can't think of the name of it. 
But anyway, I worked out at a bank in Charleston for a few years and really enjoyed it. And my family owns a bank in Oklahoma. It's a small family owned bank. It's just us that owns it. And we have a few locations in Oklahoma. And so since I was working at the bank in Charleston and really enjoyed it, my uncle was like, well, why don't you come back to Oklahoma and uh, come back and work at the bank eventually? So I did. So I went back and worked at the family bank for about 10 years, was the director of marketing. It was it was a really fun time. I learned a lot through working at the bank. Um, but banking's really boring, <laughs> not very fun to market and sell. And so I would just sit in my office and daydream about what I could possibly do. And I would daydream about either working in Utica Square or in Tulsa Arts District, which are two really cool areas of Tulsa. Like I would literally daydream about like, oh, I'm at my store and now I'm walking to lunch and I see friends and I can smell the beautiful Oklahoma wind and feel the warm air on my face and and whatnot. And so like I didn't know what I wanted to do. I would just daydream about that. And so then I had worked at the bank for about 10 years. And right at the end, um, I really knew I wanted to Cannabis had just become legal in Oklahoma and going back to like my original plan was wanting to heal people, work with people in, in, in their health, um, go to med school type deal. And so when cannabis became legal in Oklahoma, I really knew I needed to jump on that opportunity. And so I started talking to a guy who owns a chocolate store here in Oklahoma and I was talking to him about doing edibles, creating a recipe. And he just told me, he's like, well, why don't you just buy my company? And I was like, well, I didn't know it was for sale. And he's like, well, it wasn't, but I'd sell it to you. So I was working at the bank for all those 10 years and daydreaming about, you know, working in downtown or Tulsa or the Utica Square. And then this opportunity came up in 2018 where this guy allowed me to buy his business and he had two retail locations and one was in Utica Square and one was in the Tulsa Arts District. Both the places I would just sit around and like daydream about. So that's, I don't know if you saw on Facebook, I posted the other day. I was like, if you guys can just learn to passionately daydream, you will manifest some of the craziest shit. <laughs> yeah, it was a total, I didn't know anything about manifesting or anything at the time and just totally manifested. I kept manifesting. Like I wanted a business with that had locations in the, in those two places. And I wanted to sell something that made people happy. And so I ended up with a chocolate store and a, and a cannabis dispensary. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I never could have manifested something that amazing. Like I, I tell people all the time, like you have to be real careful when you're manifesting. Cause if you put too many qualifiers in there, you might not get something as cool as you could have, <laughs> you know? And so, um, anyway, ended up uh, owning the chocolate company and the cannabis store and have had those for about five and a half years now. Oh, you're on. It was, yeah. October 2018 was when I left the bank. And then, uh, well, yeah, right at the end of September, beginning of October 2018 was when I left the bank and he offered to help me, uh, let me buy his company, the chocolate company. That was horrible. Yeah. So we closed on the business in April of 2019. And so when March of 2020 hit, we were like 11 month business owners. And I mean, I went from banking and my business partner was in real estate. So we went from banking and real estate to chocolate manufacturing and retail, like completely nothing that we knew about in our previous lives. Right. So we had to learn complete new businesses, learn about food, manufacturing, learn about retail, shipping, all these other things. Um, and I, just as I was starting to feel comfortable in that, it was about a year um, is when COVID hit. And when COVID hit, I was three weeks shy of my one year anniversary of owning the business and had to lay off. We had about 40 employees at the time and I had to lay off all but six. So I was just devastated. And then my business partner, her husband was an ER doctor and he diagnosed the first patient in Tulsa 
So she couldn't leave her house for six weeks. The hospital wouldn't let her leave. So I had to run the businesses by myself. And I mean, I had just laid everybody off. But in Oklahoma, luckily, we are in Oklahoma. So we were able to stay open and continue making sales. But I think I was just working like 100 to 120 hours a week at the time. We were having a hard time getting chocolate in and yeah, different things. Yeah. Yeah, it was crazy. Well, it it made a big difference for me. Well, I had a Gaia, I call it my Gaia awakening in 2018. It actually happened the day after I committed to buying my chocolate company. <laughs> it's like you take that risk and then the awakening happens. So I had the Gaia awakening where I kind of went down the Bruce Lipton, Joe Dispenza path, you know, of just kind of learning that type of stuff and learning meditation. 2020 is when my um, political awakening happened. I, I really wasn't super, I mean, I knew there was corruption, don't get me wrong, but I had no idea <laughs> the the true corruption of what was going on in this world. I I didn't trust the shot, but I didn't think they'd actually do anything to harm people. Like that was so beyond what I thought was possible in this world. And so um, a lot of anger, <laughs> a lot of frustration, a lot of trying to talk to everyone around me and nobody would listen. Um, we did have an employee. All of our employees were pretty scared of COVID. We had one employee that had just had a liver transplant, like in the middle of COVID. And so that really like, everybody was like, get your shot, get your shot, get your shot. And there was no conversation to be had other than get your shot around us. Um, and stay six feet apart and wear your mask and do all these things. And just so as I'm learning about the corruption, the same time all this stuff is happening, I was it was watch. It was learning about it and watching it in real time. I mean, at the, all at the same time. It was absolutely absurd. I felt like my head was spinning. I felt like everybody around me was really frustrated because I was trying to have these conversations with people. Nobody wanted to have them. Um, and then I was watching my business tank. I mean, I was watching our business. We were, my credit is so bad now because we took such a hit. I mean, we couldn't get the banks to give us any relief. We did get some of the PPP loans and stuff like that, but we didn't get a whole lot of relief from like other groups did. And so, I mean, it was creditors calling nonstop for a year. My phone, I still like get scared when my phone calls. I still have PTSD from that because we just couldn't make enough money and our, our landlords were coming after us for rent and all that stuff. So I'm watching it on every single level. I mean, plus I was working a hundred hours a week and I just... I was in a whirlwind, a tornado of anger, fear, but then also the love that was coming through my spiritual awakening. Like, thank God my spiritual awakening did start in that guy of a way two years prior. So I had a lot of practice of bringing my light back and bringing the love back in. So I think there's value in that love and light stuff, but I definitely learned that not everything was love and light real fast. <laughs> yeah. It was extreme. Oh, I mean, we spent it on payroll in three weeks. Yeah, no.
That made me so mad. I still hear stories about it. And I just being a banker and like it, my family is pretty ethical in banking and I'm pretty serious when it comes to paying your bills and all that stuff and doing things the right way. And I mean, I was so mad when I heard a lot of what people were doing because I'm like, we can't even keep our head above water. We're a female owned business in Oklahoma. We're local. We're we literally do have some of the best chocolates in the world. I'll say it. <laughs> and uh, we it just it's like this business is such a legitimate business. It's such a wonderful business. And to watch all these people around us that didn't need the money, taking the money in like I. I was really angry. Mm hmm. I was curious. Yeah. Like I got $80,000 and I had to lay off 30 employees, you know, I mean, it was just like, it was crazy. I mean, it's the P there were people getting it that didn't need it. And the people that really needed it weren't getting enough. And it just, but it felt so jumbled on purpose, you know, which is, I think is what helped me wake up because it was like, once I was experiencing that stuff on that level, I mean, I was experiencing it. I couldn't not wake up, you know? No, that came in 2022. So that came even after COVID. Um, it was March of 2022. I remember this show came out on Gaia, Galactic Messages that Gosha, Pleiadian, um, the Galactic Messages had just come out on Gaia. And so I uh, watched that those eight episodes and I've gone back and watched them since. I don't fully resonate with everything, but it was just the first time I'd ever heard the word Arcturian or the word Pleiadian, or the word, or Syrian, or whatever. I mean, I've heard of the planets, or the stars, don't get me wrong, but I never heard of, like, and seeing a picture of the beings from there. I mean, I just remember I was crying. My partner at the time, I kept running in the other room, and I was like, come watch this. It's amazing. They're real. They're real. I knew they were. And I was so excited. <laughs> so that was just about two years ago. Yeah. Yeah. And um, in the beginning, it was a, it was in June of 2022. I was sitting out under the stars every night and this one star just kept blinking at me and calling my name. And finally I got my star app out and I was like, what is that? And it turned out it was Arcturus. And um, I am, I actually, I have an intuitive that I worked with for about a little over a year. She's, and she's one of those ladies that's been doing it for 30 years that we were talking about, like before we got on and very incredible. And she told me once, she's like, I, they're showing me your 53% Arcturian. And I was like, that feels pretty, pretty right. I think I know I've had Lyran and Pleiadian and Syrian and other experiences as well, but Arcturus seems to be the one that definitely feels the most like home. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Everything changed. Um, all of it. <laughs> I, and so that was in 2022. And since then in 2023, I resigned from all my businesses and sold some of the stock. I didn't sell all my stock. I sold about half of it so I could take off a couple of years. Um, my awakening hit pretty heavy and pretty deep. And I running three businesses simultaneously was too much for me at the time. Plus my brain chemistry started changing. I swear I was like so great at making business plans, doing P&Ls, running my budgets, running all of those things. And then 
once the galactic awakening hit, my brain chemistry changed and those things became very difficult for me. Like I just, all of a sudden I couldn't sit down and write a budget. I couldn't sit down and write another do P and L's for the business. I mean, it was my brain changed. And so, um, I worked at the business for about another year after the galactic awakening and things just started changing so much. And I started also getting more and more frustrated with like, the the processes of business of working with the cities and the permits and the licensing and all of that stuff i started getting more frustrated all that and then in my family life things um fell apart pretty drastically too and my uh with my parents and my siblings things have happened that were pretty drastic in the last year two years as well so it was like business was changing drastically family life was changing drastically awakening was changing me drastically like and then I broke up with my partner that I was living with. So even that changed drastically. All of that changed basically last summer. So left job, um, broke up with a boyfriend. And then my dad died a couple of months ago, about three months ago. And I haven't spoken to my mom in two years. And it's just, it's wild. It's like everything, absolutely everything in my life has changed. I don't know where to go next. <laughs> I love that question. Um, I think this is really important because that's probably the hardest thing I had to go through. I came from a family that was very loyal, very trusting, very dutiful. Um, you know, I mean, we did own a bank. It was very, you know, you've got to do your duty, be respectful to the family, be responsible to the family, be responsible for the community. And, and um, I just felt like I was carrying everyone, the community, my business, my family, everyone on my shoulders. And I was for a very long time. Um, that was part of my role. I was very glad to carry it. But when I changed from that role of carrying everyone with me to having to release all of it within 12 months and walk away, people are like, wait, no, don't go. Where are you going? Don't leave the business. Don't break up. Don't do this. Don't do that. People do not want you to change. That was so hard. And I'm almost glad I had so much of it to deal with at once. Cause I think it made it easier for me <laughs> to deal with all of it at once. But I had to let go on the deepest level I ever could have imagined of what anyone else thought of me. That was the first thing I had to do was let go of what anyone else thought of me. Um, when I say it is none of my business what other people think of me, I truly live that daily now. It is none of my business what other people think of me. That was so hard for me to do coming from being the sorority girl and the valedictorian and the community person and all of that. Um, I'm still working through how to have the conversation with my family. Like, they're still like, well, are you going to go get a job or what are you going to do, Katie? You know, you need to do something. And I'm still trying to figure out how to talk in ways that make it okay for me to not have a plan and to not worry about people's thoughts about me not having a plan. That's, that's something that I'm just having to release and let go of. But, um, it, it takes a lot of up and downs. It takes a ton of releasing a ton of meditation, working with your guides. Um, but then being grateful for the outcome of the changes 
is the most important part of it, probably. Um, when I was like, even after dad passed about, he passed about three months ago, but it was about a month ago I was in there and I was just thinking about like, literally it was last July that I left the business last August that my boyfriend moved out, you know, all these things changed. So it has all been within 12 months. And so I was laying there in bed and I was in the worst mood I'd been in probably in five years, <laughs> which was really bad. And I was laying in bed, just like, I have got to get in a better mood. Like I'm not looking for love and light. I'm just looking for a lot less anger <laughs> right now, you know? And so I laid in bed and I just started naming all the things I was grateful for. And it took me about 30 to 40 minutes to get to a place where I could name them without still being angry. <laughs> I didn't get to a place of love and light by any means. I just got to a place where I let the anger go. So just finding ways to be able to cope when the moments get way too overwhelmed with stress, because there were a lot of them, um, finding ways to cope with those moments. Well, one of the first things I faced was how bad my discernment was. Um, that was really hard because, you know, I thought I was a know-it-all for a long time. But uh, recognizing how bad my discernment was, um, part of that was because I learned about all the things that were lies around me that I didn't recognize were lies. Um, part of it was dealing with people within business that were different than I thought they were. You know, I mean, just all different kinds of things. So, uh, Rec recognizing my um, need to to sharpen my tools and discernment was probably one of the first things that came out of that. Um, one of the second was my fear of what everybody was going to think around me when I left my job was real strong. Um, the only way I can ex that I've explained it to people that made a little bit of sense is, you know, if you grow up in a super super religious family. And then you want to come out later in life as gay to your parents <laughs> and there, you know, it's coming out of the closet. It kind of feels like that. Like when you're coming from a family who's so together and so career oriented and, and all of the things to like, to be able to walk away and say, I'm not going to go get another job and I'm not going to, I'm going to trust this. That was, that was really hard. And I mean, just, I've, I, I made a really big name for myself in the Tulsa community. I mean, I was on multiple boards and, and whatnot, and I made a really big name. And I think I've just, I've changed so much that everyone in Tulsa is like, who is she? And what has they, what have they done with Katie Mabry? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so I've had to deal with it. I've had to deal with the, with the changes that I've been going through internally, knowing how beautiful these changes are and not being able to explain them to anybody and people looking at me going, gosh, she was such an amazing person. And now she never leaves her house and she doesn't go out in the community and she quit her job and she, you know, like, but I don't, I'm, I'm, so I'm having a hard time, like feeling comfortable in that, you know? Mm -hmm. The old identity is completely crumbling. It's like not even, you know, and yeah, when you think of yourself as a community leader and then your identity crumbles, you're like, God dang it. I don't know. I'm scared to go to the grocery store and run into anybody Yeah.
I am literally like within the last two weeks just getting there. So this is perfect. Um, I love this question. So one of the major things in that is that I am learning to live in the flow of the universe. That when you come from being somebody who's so scheduled and so, you know, all the things like it's really hard to that's another thing I had to release was like just releasing all of that, releasing my calendar, releasing the planning and the, all of that and, and, and having a three year plan and a five year plan and all those things. So those are um, that's definitely something that I've worked on releasing. And now I'm learning to live in the flow of the universe. So number one, trusting that whatever I need will be there for me. I don't need to go and get do DoorDash and get a job and all these things because I know that money is going to be there for me somehow. And so far that's been working out. So then um, the, the next thing that's been really hard was like, how do I just function from day to day? I used to wake up early, get dressed, go to the job, come home at 5 p.m., then go to dinner with friends and out and home by 11, you know, and it's like now I'm like at home all day and I don't have to be up or down by any certain time and I don't know what to do with my time and myself and my hands. <laughs> and so I've had to really do that. And so I've kind of just learned what it's allowed me to do is to take each day and become intuitive with the day. So I wake up and I kind of feel into the day. What do I feel like I need to get into today? And it's allowed me to like on a day to day level, learn how to flow with the universe intuitively. And that's been very hard, <laughs> way harder than I thought it would have been to, to make that switch. I had a lot of guilt around my time and my accomplishments early on um, or lack thereof, I guess I should say. Um, but then I recognized my work in my meditation as a different form of rewarding type of work than completing a project at the business, you know? Um, and so I'm just trying to go back to I'm trying to remember what the original question was. <laughs> the purpose. Okay. So in the last couple of weeks, it's really been the, the pattern I've noticed throughout my whole awakening is how connected I've been to Gaia um, the consciousness of the planet earth Gaia. And, um, it feels like part of what I'm here to do is to help people fall in love with Gaia. I am obsessed with this planet and everything about her. I love being here. I am confident. I can confidently say that of all of the planets that I've lived on, I think Earth is absolutely one of my favorite. Um, I, a lot of star seeds I know don't feel that way because it's really exhausting being here. It's very 3D. It's very heavy. It's very dense. It's very frustrating. It's very dualistic, but I'm obsessed with it. I think it's one of the most beautiful planets out there. And I know I have that feeling. Like I remember having that feeling from other lifetimes. Like I'm like, I just want to be on earth. So part of my purpose of being here is to share the beauty of Gaia in a different way with all of the beings on the planet, star seeds, non-star seeds, whatever. I want to help star seeds fall in love with being here again. I know we're all exhausted. I think we're supposed to be exhausted right now though. Uh, we wouldn't change it if we weren't. We wouldn't be coming to this head if we weren't. And so like, I think that there's a lot of I'm still like my galactic awakening, all this stuff is still pretty new, but it feels like a lot of elementals are coming in. I work with the Sasquatch a lot. I know I've been an elemental on this planet quite a few times in the past. Um, so in some way it feels like I'm going to be working with her and trying to get everyone to fall back in love with her. Um, and then, so right now the way that that is coming out in itself has been a lot of grid work. I've, didn't even know what grid work was a year ago. <laughs> and now I feel like I've been called to a lot of places. I go out in Oklahoma quite often. I love finding a lot of spots where people don't go to as often. I mean, Mount Shasta and Sedona are awesome. Cool. They really are. I'm going to Mount Shasta in a couple of weeks, but there are just as many amazing places inside the state of Oklahoma as there are places like that. Like Lily and I two weeks ago just went to um, southwest Oklahoma near Fort Sill and it's called Medicine Park and there's a vort energy vortex there, the 40 foot hole. 
that you can hike to. There's the parallel forest that's like super haunted. There's a mountain there that UFOs are caught going in and out of. There's tunnels. There's all kinds of stuff. I mean, just absolute incredible, amazing stuff. We've gone to Arkansas and found really cool places. And Starved Rock Park in Illinois, Custer Park, you know, there's just places all over the U.S. And so I think right now um, my goal is going to be trying to get out to these places, find as many of these like fun little places as much as possible and try to share those with the community and recognize that other star seeds can get out and do the same thing. I mean, like we were talking, there's people in Wisconsin, people in Canada, people in, you know, Arkansas, Kansas. I mean, there are places in every single state that we can go and help help Gaia reach her full potential. So, so the way that the DNA has worked with me in that is what I've recognized is when I go to some of these places, then I can kind of come in touch with past lives. And so, um, like when I went up to state rock park, Illinois, starved rock park, Illinois, um, I'm sorry, my cat's going to get real loud. <laughs> Right. He used to get um, yeah. But it was around that point where I was started like reconnecting with my past lives as a Native American. And it turns out around 400 years ago, I was living in that area of Starved Rock, Illinois, going back and forth kind of between St. Louis and Starved Rock. And there was a lot of Native on Native um, fighting back then. And um, so, yeah. And so I went back up to that area to help do some grid work, clear some of the fighting that had gone in when I lived with that tribe back in the day. And then the Sasquatch worked with me up there. We helped do some clearing. But as I was doing that, it was reactivating my DNA, I think, from those past lifetimes. Because then for the next like six months, all I wanted to do was get out in the country. I needed to be in extreme vastness. I was like, if I see a McDonald's, I'm going to scream. I just want to see land for a hundred miles, you know? And so I started going out to Western Oklahoma a lot around that time. And it's real flat out there. And I would just go and spend the night in a real flat area where I could just feel nothing but the vastness of the land and the sky. And it was like that DNA was reactivating from those past lives. It feels like. Um, I think there's going to be some, some more, I mean, I think a lot of us are healers in different ways. I think there's going to, there's some more healing type abilities coming forward at this time. Um, I, when I went to med, when I wanted to go to med school, I mean, I wanted to go to med school cause I wanted to help heal people. I wanted to help get them better, but I knew back then that intuitively I knew that that was not the way. And so I didn't go. And so I think now there's going to be, I don't know, I keep getting downloads about what's coming in the future healing center of some sort, I think is going to be coming forward. Yeah. I mean, we got a lot of work to do to get anywhere, first of all. <laughs> but I do think there's going to be a balance. Um, I think that I think it's going to take longer than what we all seem to think it's going to take. I think everything it's already taking longer than what we thought it would. You know, um, I've heard some people talk about like, oh, the awakening's coming in the next couple of years. I really think humanity is going to have the ability to jump on the bandwagon of awakening for like the next 50 years. For some reason, that's what it feels like for me. I don't think that people are going to be chances over here in the next few years. So I think that we're going to have kind of a hybrid model for a while, for maybe a hundred years or so of this awakening, new technology coming in. Hopefully we take AI. I, know, I think we're going to be working with AI. I think that that's inevitable. 
hopefully we're taking it in a positive direction and not with the dark, getting away from the Saturn rings and all these other things we've been dealing with. But um, I, I do feel a much more natural way of life coming forward. I think that I really hope what we see is the breakdown of these really large monopoly companies that own our food and our medicine and our media to break down and let that go back to the local. Like if we could break those down and just bring even food back to local, that would make all of our experiences in this life so much more filled with nature because we would be closer to our food and we would be filling our bodies with things that come from Gaia more from than from all of this processed crap. And I think that's going to help us want to get in tune with Gaia more, like just by eating more natural foods. I think a lot of people are going to want it to be in tune with her more. I do see, I don't see things going like pure natural. I don't think we're going to be going to too far backwards or anything like that. But I do think that we will be finding ways to work with her and uh, with Gaia instead of against her the way we have been for the last thousand years. Mm -hmm. Mm Right. Well, and I think we kind of need to. And I think we need to before things get too galactic, because what happened if you if you get, you know, all of our friends down here on ships and get the humans attention, then they're all just going to want to go, oh, I want to go out there. When really we, we have come so far from our connection from Gaia, like we are so far from it and we have got to reconnect that connection before we can run off to the stars. And if we don't do that, then we're going to not, we're not going to be able to ground in that appreciation for where we came from. And so we're never going to start treating her the way she deserves to be treated.
it's no, it's so bad. And it's also screwing up our DNA, right? Eating all this crap, it's hurting our DNA. And then when you Oh yeah. Yeah. We just like things quick and fast. And I mean, like, I get it. I hate cooking and I hate grocery shopping and I am not a fan of all of that. And I think a lot of that ha comes from being a star seed. Like, I think I usually just drink a blue liquid on our tourists, you know, like eating is just a pain. Well, that's true. Wow. <laughs> I, I Well, and it's like I mean, I have conversations on the, on the daily with people and it's like well, yeah, I know the food's bad and yeah, whatever, but they still don't see the corruption in the government or they still don't. It's like people see a little bit of evidence, but they don't put the whole story together, which then they're giving up their consent completely. Right. Which is why we do it in America. We're so busy with our own daily lives. Like all my friends have young kids. Kids sports is psychotic psychotic the way it keeps families so busy it is terrifying the way it keeps families so busy i'm like do you guys even have time to sit down for a family meal or are you just constantly playing sports they're constantly playing sports that's absolutely the answer You can't. I mean, it's just go, 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 go. And it's about what's on TV or what is happening in sports or what your friends are doing or whatever. But there's no real conversations anymore. And the more that I started waking up, and especially after I started politically, politically waking up because I got so annoying. Um, <laughs> it, it, these were like people would get really upset with me, really genuinely upset with me. And they'd be like, Katie, I can't have these conversations. I have too much going on in my personal life. Huh. Well, and they're like, I just have too many things. My life is too stressful. I have to go do this. I have to go do that. I have to go do this. I have to go do that. I have to raise my kids. I can't think about these other things. And I'm like, Man, how do you get people over that? Because like, I remember being there too at one point where like, I was just so busy. I couldn't think about anything else, but what was going on in my life. And, but then it's like, they're keeping you and everyone in that place on purpose so that they won't have these conversations. It's like, if you could just break that dam, that one dam. Um, mm -hmm, yeah. Wait for the I know. Yeah.
<laughs> I am now. Yeah, I've gotten a lot better about it. It was really hard in the beginning for me. Um, I think in the beginning, it was like, I was just so excited about everything. I felt like I wanted to share it. And everybody was like, Rawr! and I'm like, God, why this isn't that scary? And then, you know, the political stuff and the galactic, even talking about aliens and stuff, people are just like, no, I can't think about that. I have too much in my own life to think about. So I, for a long time, I think I was really bad about driving people crazy. Um, and I have come to terms with and accepted the fact that I need to <laughs> not drive. I mean, and it wasn't everyone that I was driving crazy, but just the people closest to me, you know, and I'm like, it, I, I got really frustrated to a point because I was like, you guys want to talk about everything going on in your lives. You want to talk about your children. You want to talk about your business. You want to talk about your parents. You want to talk about those things. Like, do you, not, do you not want me to talk about what's going on in my life? Because this is what's going on in my life. My awakening was was so heavy that it was almost everything at that point. And um, they they just didn't. And that's when I recognized that it wasn't that they didn't care. It was they didn't have the capacity. I think that's what happened to me in my awakening in the beginning. It was like so much new stuff comes in. It was coming in. It was like ability to do PNLs was going out. <laughs> there wasn't enough room for it all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, that's, uh, whew, that recharged my battery real quick. I think going to that first journey to truth conference well, it was the first time I met Lily. And then the first journey to truth conference, I was like, I think I had to come home and sleep for almost a month. I was so brr. <laughs> because you just, for the first time you're around so many awakened souls and you're having, every time you turn around, you're having an awakened conversation and you're like, Oh my God, this is incredible. And so I think I just, yeah, was in all the first year I was there. Um, this year I handled it a lot better, <laughs> but it was, it was, wonderful. I mean, you literally refill your battery and then you go back home and it's a little bit easier to be able to function in, in society. And you, um, the way that the community's changed, I mean, I haven't been a part of it that long, only two years, like I said, but the way that it's even changed within two years from only having a couple of few podcasts that I was watching early on to like, now there's so many more podcasts and like the fact that I'm actually even talking on some of these interviews and, and having these conversations, it's, it's mind blowing. It feels from day to day, like things are changing really slow, but then you look back two years and you're like, wow, we really have come a long way and things have changed faster than they think. I think everything feels really slow on the day to day, but things have moved a lot quicker and, um, the community is growing so significantly and, 
access to each other is growing. And that's one of the things that I've been talking about a lot too, is I want this whole community to start focusing really hard on abundance so that we can get together physically. It takes money to travel and to get together. And we have got to be in each other's presence and feeding off each other's energy. But the only way to do that is to truly start focusing on abundance. The the star seeds, there's two main themes that like a lot of people are exhausted with earth and they don't want to come back. And then a lot of people are just like turned off by money. Well, money is what makes this world go around right now. <laughs> I mean, obviously love does too, but you have to have money to function. You have to, and money is not a bad thing. It's just an energy. Energy can be good or bad. It's what you put into it. And we've got to find a way as a star seeds to start changing the energy that we put around money. Because if we continue to have this negative attitude towards it, then it's going to stay in the hand of the bad guys. And look how that's treating us. It's not going very well. So for us to be able to really change things and to do something, we have to get the money out of their hands and into our hands so that we can spend it wisely. And I really want to see, like, I think the main thing I hear from star seeds is, Oh, I can't afford to go to that conference or I can't afford to go to that retreat or whatever. I wish I could. And it's like, we have got to start where the only way we can change that as above is to change the so below. So we've got to change the so below by accepting abundance one by one within the starseed community, being comfortable with being able to bring in more finance finances so that we can afford to get together and put meet each other and exchange our energy and then also put our finances in the right places so that we can get the right projects going on earth to turn this shit around. It's my soapbox. Oh, you there, Erica? You're freezing up. Absolutely. That's, that's, yeah, interesting that you say that I keep talking about like the grid work that I do. It's that I go to all these sacred spaces around me close to Oklahoma so that when I go to the bigger places, I can exchange the energy and bring some of it back home. That is so important. Connecting the dots, making the connections. And we can, we have to get out there physically to be able to do that. And to get out there physically, we have to be able to afford it. Yeah, we do. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely.
Yeah. Yeah. significantly um yeah i it's just funny the way my perspective has changed so much <laughs> in the last two years like drastically on no oh, kind of what's important to me and who's important to me in my relationships and all of that stuff and like i said a lot of stuff has happened within my family my my internal family to to allow some space for relationships to change a little bit easier i guess i could say but even with like my business partners and my close friends around Tulsa, um, those relationships have been changing very drastically. It's been really weird. I don't talk to those people as much anymore. I don't see them as much anymore. And that time and space is getting filled with all the people I'm meeting in this community. And um, there was a little bit of guilt around it, I think, in the beginning. But the more that I recognized what it was doing to fill my soul, when I was able to have the conversations that I was wanting to be able to have that were helping me grow versus the conversations about the regular matrix stuff, I recognized how much better I felt after. And I was like, I have got to get over my guilt and over anything like that and allow these relationships to organically change in my life because I'm looking for growth. And, and I just accepted that. I decided I, I accept I'm going to look for growth and I'm going to commit to that. And that, that may be, I don't think that means losing friends necessarily. I'm not going around and new friends and telling them I don't want to be friends anymore. You just kind of slowly, you know, fade away. Um, but I will say I'm probably going to be moving from Tulsa within the next year or so. And that's something I never in a million years thought I would have done. Um, I mean, I did move to Charleston, South Carolina for a couple of years, a long time ago, but 20 years ago, but, um, I thought I was back here for good, but it's, it's changing. Everything's changed so much that I even have the confidence of moving. My mother keeps telling people I'm in a cult. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's it's weird. It's it, I don't think anybody would see it this way from the outside, but it's actually the freest I've ever been it, within this group of people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
That's a really good question. I feel like I actually have had a few people reach out to me in the last few weeks. Um, cause I've done a cup. This is my third interview. I think that I've done in like a few months. And so I've posted those on Facebook and I mean, I was scared to death when I hit posts <laughs> on those interviews. And then a few people watched them and they contacted me and I was like, Oh shit, <laughs> please don't watch that. <laughs> but they did. And you know, they, they did cause they were called to for a reason. And I've had three or four people reach out to me recently that I never in a million years thought would have reached out to me, but they saw my interview cause I posted it and they decided to watch it or they saw something that I posted and they decided to watch it. And they're like, wait, you, you know about these things. And I was like, yeah. And so I've been able to go to lunch with some people recently that, and people that I barely knew, but I mean, right now, unfortunately, I think social media is the easiest way just because like for me, I think as, as connected as I was in the Tulsa community and as well known or whatever as I have been, when I post something out there, you know, some people think it's weird or whatever, but luckily I have enough friends that the right people that need to see it will. And so like, even in my own community, there's like a few people that are just starting to like, Hey, can I ask you some more questions about these? Or can you tell me a little bit more about that book? Or can we go to lunch or whatever? Um, especially when I go to the sacred sites around Oklahoma and post about those on Facebook, they get a lot of people get at me around that stuff too. Cause that kind of even hits a wider range of audience hikers and things like that, you know? Um, but I really think it's just continuing to be comfortable in being your authentic self. That has been the biggest lesson of that's the, the reason I have any comfort in being able to do what I am today is because I learned how to be comfortable with being authentic. And if that pisses people off, that's okay. Just kind of letting it exude out of you. And then that way when people can pick up on the clues and they're like, Oh, that lady might have a question to one of my, or an answer to one of my questions or something, you know? setting intention. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> the I just keep scheduling the trips and I'm like, they'll get paid for. <laughs> they'll get paid for. And they do, they get paid for it every time it all works out. So mm -hmm. we're just so used to having, like having this thought process of having to plan, having to organize, having to have all of our ducks in a row before we take a step. And it's like, I think they taught us that because that's the absolute opposite of what we're actually supposed to be doing. So, you know. Absolutely. Especially if you're flying over the pond, <laughs> you got to go first class. <laughs> Thank you, ladies. I appreciate it. And thank you for, thank you for interviewing. I, I, I think it's so important. I saw you ever interviewed my good friend, Robert Gartner the other day and some other people. And I just feel like it's so important. I think people are really excited to get to their stories out there, but to hear different stories. And, you know, when newbies come to the community and they hear other newbie stories, it makes them feel a little bit more comfortable. Like not everybody's an expert. And so I really appreciate it. He's a great guy. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, ladies.
Right. It is. It's funny. Somebody asked me the other day, they were like, how did you meet your friend Lily? And I was like, YouTube. <laughs> they were like, <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's how I meet my friends now. YouTube. <laughs> it's just different. It's a different world, you know, but thank goodness we do have this. Yeah. Thank goodness we have the ability to be able to share. So. It's like, it's what it is now. Thanks, ladies. It's good to talk to you.